think the future of Google is going to get impacted by the rise of ChatGPT and Bing, and it will eventually get replaced by them? What's your thought? And I think, you know, in many ways, Google is an AI first company and has been working on these things for a long time.、Mm-hmm. So I, I'm sure they have a role to play. I think you'll also see lots of new、uh, companies, you know, OpenAI and others to, to you know, to enter this, this space. And to, I also think like there's going to be a ton of just un, unknowns and things that go wrong and,、uh, you know, automation run amok kind of thing. Hey guys, this is Dr. Nancy Lee, a director of product featured in Forbes. I've helped 100 people land their dream PM job offer in fan companies and unicorn startups, and continue to get promoted as a product leader. In this channel, we talk about tech trends and free product management training. Like and subscribe, and check out our new video every Tuesday. Very excited to have our guest today, Robert Latham, and it's such an honor to bring Rob on our show because Rob. Has a very amazing journey. He currently is a VP of product at Google and also product leader at Meta. Also started two successful product in the past. And Rob, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me.、Uh, doing really well.、Uh, I've been enjoying some time, some vacation recently, and、uh, yeah, just really excited to to share some thoughts with、uh, with you and the audience here. Awesome. So, Rob, let me、uh, ask you a quick question. Where are you based right now? Uh, I'm in Austin, Texas. So、yes. I lived in the Bay Area for quite a while, and then actually moved to Boulder, and moved back to the Bay Area, and then moved to Austin at the end of 2019. So I've been here、uh, for a few years now. This is awesome.、So、you actually moved before the booming of pandemics.、So、Just before, yes, and was traveling back and forth to the Bay Area, and had you know a desk in. At Facebook at the time, had a desk in Menlo Park, had a desk in Austin. I got all my stuff back from Austin, by the way. When I left the company, I st- I'm still waiting for my stuff from Menlo Park, funnily enough. I see. Awesome. Given you had such amazing journey in different company and also move across different places and making your own personal and career choice, do you want to give us a quick overview of your background? Sure. Yeah. Just going going backwards. I've, I've you know been in big tech companies the last six years.、Uh, the last two years with Google,、uh, working in the central privacy and security team, and then before that, I ran the product team for a group at Facebook, now Meta, called Business Integrity. So it was you know those were kind of my first big tech company roles the last six years.、And、then before that,、uh, started two different companies.、Um, one was actually an ad blocking company. We sold the technology before I joined Facebook, and then. Before that, built one of the largest、uh, ads API partners to companies like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn.、Um, we started in display advertising, but then we pivoted to social media ads.、Uh, we sold that business in 2013. Before that, you know, I'd, I'd worked at a few different places. I worked at LinkedIn for a little while, which was interesting in the very early days when we had like 40 people at the company. Like you, I also grew up and moved to the U.S. Grew up overseas and moved to the U.S. You know, went to college in the U.S., etc. So, yeah, it's been it's been a journey, but、uh, yeah, very very glad to be here. Awesome! Another immigrant story. So let me ask you, Rob, where are you original from?、Uh, I grew up in South Africa. Wow, this is beautiful. It's always a place I want to visit. Actually, I have a student currently is in Nigeria and another in Kenya. It's like very global. This is amazing. Great to see lots of people just creating amazing career and cross cultures, cross companies as well. Which leading to our today's main topic regarding building trust in large and small and different sizes of. Organizations, because we believe that the culture differences, and also even within the large organization, that different people from very different perspective, the the trust is actually very important for product managers to build. And actually, I I look up online, actually, fifty five percent of the business owners feel like. Having having trust is one of the most important core value of the success of their company, and it's it's crazy. And also from product management's perspective, we are also building trust among different stakeholders. And therefore, today I want to hear from your perspective regarding you have been working in like forty people LinkedIn team when they started, and also all the way to manage your own large organization in Google and Meta as a VP of product. Can you share with us regarding why trust is so important in all sizes of companies from product perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the product manager has a pretty unique role, and, and it's kind of like、uh, you know, there's lots of different takes on how to be a good product manager and what it actually means. And but often you're kind of someone on my team once described it as you're the glue 
that's holding a lot of things together. And so, you know, glue is something that you really have to trust, or maybe it's zip ties or something else, but it's something that kind of needs to bind things together. And in itself, you know, people need to trust that you can help facilitate things. I think also that's like not really the case, and we can talk more about why I don't think that's the case. But I think there's also you know, a lot of misperception about the role of product management. I think mm -hmm. there's you know, a lot of people who actually, um, I actually used to see this when people would want to transfer to become a product manager from another discipline. Often their understanding of what a PM does was different than the reality. And I think once they learned the reality, some of them were like, no, I actually don't want to do that job. I don't want to be in meetings all day. So I think trust is really important because you know, like a lot of other things as well, the product manager is mm -hmm. facilitating a lot of things. And so to be a good facilitator, I think you need to be someone that is trustworthy and, and, and someone that can, you know, help bring people together. Awesome. So Rob, I do want to dive deeper a little bit regarding the CEO product. You think you have a different opinion regarding the CEO product. So what's in reality what product manager is doing? If we are not the CEO, are we the COO or CMO? <laughs> so tell us more. Well, well, I've been a CEO and a COO and, uh, you know, I've, I've had some of these jobs. Um, but no, I think the, um, you know, I think of the, one of the things I think of uh, a product manager is doing is, you know, being responsive. And this is, again, these are not my words, but, you know, learning from others uh, originally. So, you know, the product manager is, is, is responsible for high quality of decisions that are made about the product, right? So, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's in some cases, depending on the size of the team and the situation, you know, you're making some decisions or the way in which you're framing already is directing things a certain way. In some ways, a CEO, a good CEO, I think often is a facilitator. But the difference with a CEO, I think, having been one is at the end of the day, when someone has to make a decision, you know, no one else has made the decision, you're making the decision. You know, the other way, the other thing that, that happens is if, you know, your AWS instances go down at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know, you and maybe the CTO are the ones, you know, getting on the phone, you know, et cetera. Like you're the last line of whatever. I mm -hmm. think the PM sometimes has that role, but really a lot, lot, a lot more. It's like helping within the structure of whatever that organization, facilitating decision making and making sure those decisions are of high quality. Love it. When you emphasize on the facilitating part, I think at the lead to the challenges we're talking about regarding building trust. Can you tell us why it's so challenging and crucial? We talk about crucial is important. Uh, why it's so hard to actually build in trust and facilitate and bring everyone on the same page mm -hmm. as a product manager? Yeah, I think a lot of times people are coming from different perspectives and different history with PMs. You know, I think I think it was Lenny Richiski recently was saying something about you know, some people have experiences of PMs that aren't good PMs. And so, you know, mm -hmm. you may have different, everyone's coming from a different background, different perspective. Some people have been in organizations where there is no PM function. So, you know, you have to kind of meet people where they're at. Um, the other thing I've also seen is, um, for example, with a lot of, you know, in smaller organizations, you have engineering managers who are taking on that role of essentially some of the, some of the things that a, that a PM would do, you know, and there hasn't been a PM function and you're creating one, and then, you know, some of the things, those things are things that an engineering manager wants to continue to do or they enjoy doing. Um, so you also, depending on where your organization is, you're actually like growing into certain things and you're defining roles and creating clarity. And so, you know, you need to get to know and spend time on the relationships in order to be able to facilitate the creation of that clarity, in order to be able to also create swim lanes for people so they're not running into each other. You know, one of the things I find actually very useful mm -hmm. in this is also to you know create leadership groups where it's multiple different functions that are sitting at the same table. So you know because it can sometimes feel like PM is telling other functions what to do. Yeah. And in some cases it's kind of true, but the reality is that it's much more it's much better if it's a collaborative atmosphere and people are sitting at the same table. They're bringing different perspectives, you know, and they're kind of uh, working together in that way. This is awesome. So Rob, can you give up something? juicy which is at google or, or meta you can pick any of the the large companies from their perspective what's in real life the challenges you guys facing you sound like real life example you can remove anything confidential we just want to see mm -hmm. from like leading tech perspective right because i i would imagine there's so many different teams in google and and sounds easy to bring people on the same table but when you actually execute it, you will face real life challenges. Can you give us some insider secret regarding like using Google or Meta as an example? What does it look like to work with others? Any kind of pushback you had when you implement the building trust strategies? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think building trust, it's not just within the firm, your problem directly. It's also when in any of these companies, when you're trying to solve a problem, you're in some cases you create other problems or you, you learn that there's other uh, confounding issues. So you know, I spent a lot of time working in the integrity or trust and safety space at Meta specifically. And so there, there's always these concerns where you're like, okay, we're going to, you know, implement this policy change that's going to that's meant to stop this particular thing what we think is bad. Mm -hmm. But obviously the detection of things is not perfect and you kind of have these concentric circles of, you know, other folks who are impacted. So what ends up happening is it's customers getting impacted, but it's also other teams getting impacted. So they may not be able to ship something. You know, they may have to work with partners to implement new, you know, new things that again create like these these other effects. So I think there's always these trade-offs that you have mm -hmm. to help manage across different teams. So it's not just across functions working on your thing. That's one aspect of this kind of cross-functional uh, leadership and, and, and value that you're helping to create. But it's also across different teams who are seeing different sides of the same, uh, the same thing. So I think one of the things we like to do, I know, for example, at Meta, one of the things we would try to do is, you know, gain alignment, for example, through sharing metrics. So we'd say, okay, this team is going to ship this thing. Um, and we want to set up some guardrails. So let's make sure that this particular metric that we agree on, it doesn't go outside of this range. If it does, then let's have a, a discussion, et cetera. So a lot of times that those mm -hmm. things were pretty, you know, manual hands-on, like, okay, we're like looking at the data every day and we're having reviews and whatever, or every, every month we might have a review about it. But then, you know, as you kind of instrument those things in your product, you can actually make it more automated. So it's just really like, not really a, a problem until, you know, you get some notification. It's like, okay, the, you know, this particular rate is dropping below this threshold. Let's, yeah. you know, go and have a discussion about it. So I think, you know, one thing is like different teams and different functions have different incentives. And so acknowledging that, mm -hmm. coming up with things that cut across those and perhaps allow you to align those incentives, metrics being one way of potentially doing that, turn out to be pretty useful. Because then also it takes some of the, yeah. it takes some of that, um, personal adversarial nature of it away because it says look we've agreed in advance on this metric if the metric goes south we'll we'll talk about it it's not really about you know you say this or i say that exactly so no wonder so like all the big tech companies they're more towards we are data driven company and even for people currently interviewing with meta or when they were hiring interviewing with meta they ask lots of like parametrics questions so basically you guys are using metric to drive the, the alignment was in different teams. Um, Rob, I do have something real life challenge. Maybe you can help me out. And um, regarding building trust in the remote environment, we frequently find out those kind of trust is harder when it's in a remote environment. When we are in person, it's easy to have some coffee. And I think it's it's more easier to build as a human dynamic. Ma nowadays is remote. Do you have specific strategies to build trust and alignment in a remote environment in both like larger companies and small companies. Yeah, so so many, many years ago, more than a decade ago, we had this thing where we had a bunch of, so my company was like 40 people, and we had a bunch of people who were remote in Chicago, New York, and other places, so and we were mainly in the Bay Area. So what I did is I said, okay, for this all hands, we're all gonna dial in from our computers. And this was way before COVID, and everyone was uh -huh. used to like, you know, Zoom and things like that. And like, people looked at me like I was really crazy because I was like, I want everyone to be on an equal footing to dial into the discussion. And so, because it's, the dynamics will be different. So we, we did that one time. It was like, people were like, okay, this is kind of weird. But I do think you need to kind of think about ways in which to put people on an equal footing in these remote settings. You know, you know, a couple things I've done with various teams is like move things around or have like a, you know, again, depending where your teams are, if they're in Europe and if you have teams in Europe and Asia, like it's pretty challenging to get something that works for everyone. So alternating different times for things, you know, recording meetings, uh, things like that. So people can kind of catch up on their own schedule. Those are all like useful things, sometimes not obvious, but useful things for remote work. Um, you know, having something that a team can own more fully if they're in a remote location is useful. Mm -hmm. So that way they don't have, there isn't like high coordination costs and, you know, very expensive kind of cross, cross time zone bandwidth stuff. What do you mean have people like high cross footing? What, what can you elaborate more? So, yeah. So like, uh, as an example, if, um, you know, let's say that I have a, a product and I have, a, I have a team in London and I have a team in um, the Bay Area and they have to talk, they have to like talk about different specs like several times a day. Like there's only yeah. so much of a window where that's that's easy. Um, however, if it's something where they can go away for like two weeks and do a sprint and, you know, then come back and then 
you know, they don't have to like align and, and chat necessarily every single day. Like I think they can more fully own a particular feature or something like that. That's that's helpful. Um, but I, I do, to your point, I don't think there's really any way to get around. You just have to meet people in person from time to time. So, you know, very targeted summits where you're talking about something for a few days can be very useful. You know, th there is a downside of some of this stuff, which is like I've also instances where people aren't super sensitive to the time of year. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, again, like also it's not just about in your area. Like if, say, you're coordinating with people in Europe and they tend to take vacation, you know, at a certain a time of, of the year. A lot of vacations, yeah. Yeah, but, but you have to just be sensitive to those things because mm -hmm. you're then going to actually, you know, in trying to make things better, you're going to make things worse because people will will say, oh, well, they're out of touch with the way things are done over here, etc. But, you know, I think even just, you know, we're seeing more and more people being somewhat local to each other or like within a few hours of each other, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even in the same time zone and being remote. I mean, that's also, you still need to spend time getting to know each other in person in those settings too. So I think that's really important. And then I think just, you know, always listening and creating opportunities for feedback. Just, we create these opportunities to try to listen to feedback, but I think sometimes, you know, we can do even more than that to, to, to hear what people are saying and to, you know, meet them, like I said, meet them where they're at. I love that. Hey, Rob, I do want to discuss in, in depth regarding the feedback systems. So currently, I know for like different companies, for example, Amazon has 360 feedback. I heard it's very stressful. You have people under you, like everybody needs to like you or you're in danger. Uh, or in other big tech companies, they have like annual performance review. How the feedback system can be implemented was in your mm -hmm. team and also cross fun like cross functionally. I personally believe that if we implement cross functionally, you need to know how to say it better because their interests mm -hmm. are not aligned um, for yeah. for some cases. So can you can you shine some light on that? Yeah. So I think yeah I think the the P zero on on feedback I think is people need to see that you take action on feedback. So I mm. think the quality of feedback goes up the more, in my opinion, and my experience the more people see that it actually makes a difference and it's not just oh we heard your feedback about x but like if x is never going to change that's you know not great so i think that's that's the main thing um, to start with but you have to kind of ask the question lots of different ways you can't also just assume hey i did the survey once or twice a year and now you know this is the full set of feedback there's always stuff that isn't said i generally think you have to facilitate mechanisms for this um, people are going to talk and going to say stuff regardless and so i think you just need to give them ways to do it in such a way that you're at least aware of these things but again i come back to what i said before is like you need to figure out how you can make the experience for people better and i think ultimately a lot of these companies you know, as knowledge workers, you know, your employees and your, your team is your biggest asset and you really have to figure out mm -hmm. how to make them, you know, happier, more efficient. And again, to, to the thing you said earlier at the top, which was, you know, give them the ability to have balance in their lives so that they actually are excited to do the work that they're that they're working on. Exactly. So specifically, how would you filter the feedback that's not constructive? For example, well, in our last episode, I talked to the senior director of product growth at uh, Stash, uh, Maria. So Maria mentioned something very interesting. She says she, she is open to feedback, but sometimes the feedback is hard to implement or she doesn't know how exactly to change it. Because one of the feedback she received is that you're too straightforward, Maria. You say, whatever you say, say to others' face. That's too straightforward. Or sometimes we'll be like, hey, Maria, your sentence structure too long. So uh, she, she came from Latin America. So the way Spanish, mm -hmm. the words, uh, construction, yeah. it's just longer than English. So she just felt like it's me speaking directly. It's my personality. How yeah. do I actually change who I am? So there is like balance out there. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what do you think? And regarding implementing those feedback and some feedback may not be as constructed as you wish. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it's not, right? So sometimes you just have to kind of take some of that into, um, into account. One other thing I found useful is like, sometimes you need help from folks to gather feedback about things you could do better. So mm -hmm. a great example was my first manager at Facebook you know, she gathered a bunch of uh, a bunch of feedback from my directs and skip levels, uh, and like she was able to get some insights that I wouldn't have gotten if I tried to ask them directly. And then I was able to act on on those things. And again, you're always going to hear sometimes things where it's like you know, this, you know, like you said, something non-constructive that you can't really address, or it's like, or something that you think is actually just part of you know who you are. And 
So not all feedback is needs to be acted on. I think that's the other thing to take into account is like yeah. sometimes people are upset or, you know, they have had certain experiences or so on. You need to kind of take everything with and, and sometimes it's really good to like bounce the feedback off of other people. So find a peer, have a mentor, be like, look, I heard this thing. I feel like this is valid. I feel like this. I'm not so sure about this. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you think? And then also sometimes playing the feedback back to people, other people gives them permission to give you the feedback as well. So you'll learn some new things. So I think feedback is something you use as a tool and you kind of then also uh, like anything, I think it's content that you can use in different ways. And again, obviously not necessarily like saying, hey, John said this thing about me because maybe it's you know, inappropriate to say who said it. But I said, you could go back to someone and say, I heard this thing from a couple of people on my team. You know, do you think, how do you think I could address this? What have you done? Have you seen examples, especially if it's a mentor or someone you trust um, who's going to be very you know, open and frank with you? I think that's also great. You can use the feedback in a few different ways. Yeah, exactly. I love this. Um, one last question to you, Rob, regarding feedback. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that sure. like some company do it like annually or quarterly, whatever. Um, what do you think is the best way to open the door and the free in terms of the frequency to receive feedback? How, how, how often do you do that? Yeah, I think it depends like what situation you are to the point you made earlier, which is like sometimes people who are new to a team are more willing and open to give feedback. Um, I had one person on my team who gave who did like a 100 day report of how things were going and was really useful. There's some really useful insights. So I think it really depends on kind of where the team and where you're at. Um, mm -hmm. you know, at one point I did a, I did a thing where, so, uh, you know, at a lot of these companies like Facebook or Google and others have pulse, uh, kind of things that they do. Where it's like an annual biannual uh, survey that they do across the company. And so I actually, I, you know, I was, we were growing very quickly, my team at, at, at Facebook meta. And, uh, you know, I felt like there were some things that were going well, some things that weren't. So I actually created like a mini monthly, like pulse survey that I just sent out anonymous. I asked people to comment anonymously or not. And. You know, that was actually really useful, but it, it, it had a short life though, because we kind of moved through those issues. It didn't feel like we needed to keep doing that. Sometimes it'll feel, it'll feel burdensome. I mean, we've all been in these situations where we're like, keep getting asked to give feedback and it gets like yeah. a bit much and then it kind of annoys you. So you kind of got to calibrate it carefully. And sometimes when things are, you know, in a, in a more nascent or uncertain state, you may want more feedback, but you also may choose to ask for the feedback differently or you know, may ask for it incidentally so it doesn't seem like you know you're overly worried about stuff there you know, again this is like again like we said tricky um, but I think you're gonna have to look at it as you know different times and places for different ways of gathering information mm -hmm. about what's going well and what's not working yeah That's yeah good. exactly I think this is a true definition of leaders understanding how to fix the problem actually own your mistakes as well and I, I bet you have gone through a lot of this when you run startups and bigger companies as well. Um, so Rob, let's ask more strategic, pro strategy question. And we talk about people uh, like feedback and trust and, and organizing different teams. Now, as we all know, the tech industry has been interrupted by AI. Do you think, and also you know, like Bing is the number one most recent download search engine recently because ChatGPT integration, different things. Do you think the future of Google is going to get impacted by the rise of ChatGPT and Bing and it will eventually get replaced by them? What's your thought? Yeah, look, I think I think everyone is going to have to Google included has to take uh, you know, has to pay attention to this stuff. Um, and I think, you know, in many ways, Google is an AI first company and has been working on these things for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure they have a role to play, you know, in, in this. Uh, I think you'll also see lots of new uh, companies, you know, OpenAI and others to, to you know, to enter this, this space and to figure out how to, how to make this stuff work. I think there's also, I mean, if you've seen the ChatGPT plugins, I think there's also a role for other companies to play where they're bringing new integrations, ways to use information. I also think like there's going to be a ton of just un, unknowns and things that go wrong and, uh, you know, automation run amok kind of thing. You know, like I know you can use the ChatGPT plugin, for example, to like queue up emails and you know I actually saw a funny cartoon yesterday I tweeted it yesterday where it was like you mm -hmm. know uh, where someone was like oh I can just take this one you know this one bullet and turn it into a whole email thanks to AI and the other person was well I can take this whole email and condense it to one bullet point so that I can print, pretend like I read it so I think you're just gonna see some really interesting overlaps in how this stuff works and how people use it but ultimately I think these things are tools they're going to have a lot of disruption in certain areas, certain parts of, of the, uh, certain industries and certain parts of the business. You know, I still think there's a lot of things where 
you will not be able to condense the answer down to like, you know, a nice paragraph or two of text. You're going to have to search and iterate and go through and look at stuff and take multiple sources into account. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I assume that these companies will figure out ways to create different experiences around these tools, whether that's a different new search experience or, you know, different ways of in interacting with other tools like email or other things. Yeah, exactly. So do you think the trend of the industry in the AI space is going to be like similar to the original booming of Web3? So all like there's a foundation of like Ethereum network and there's so many different kind of like chains, people building on top of Ethereum. And now there's like downside of downturn of the Web3 industry was because people realized that uh, not all the protocols are very necessary. And do you mm -hmm. think this will be similar trend to the AI space? Right now we're on the rise, people building different apps on top of AI. Do you think eventually we'll sort of settle down using only one best model? Could be ChatGPT or uh, different things. Oh, by the way, Google has its own BART. You have like mm -hmm. AI thing for BART. Do you think eventually mm -hmm. we'll settle down on one best model that will just synchronize the whole world as a foundation and then you build small things on top of that? Or there will be like, several like BART, ChatGPT, and AI engine, different things running in parallel. So what's, what's your yeah. prediction of the industry? Yeah, I'm sure, I think there'll be, there'll be a few. Like, I don't think there's going to be thousands. There'll be like lots of like sub models and yeah. enhancements and plugins and things on all of these. But I do think that it's probably going to be, you know, a bunch of network effects and probably a small number of folks who, have, you know, run the underlying models. You know, I think it's hard It's hard to predict how this stuff is going to go. Um, I've been playing around a lot, especially with ChatGPT, and it's, it's really interesting, and it's got, you know, it gets, it's gotten a lot better, even just in the last few months. And so I'm sure we're going to see a ton of stuff happen here. You know, I had a lot of experience, as I mentioned before, working mm -hmm. as an API partner of some of these, with some of these big companies, right? So, so yeah. if I put that lens on things, I think the, the hard thing here is figuring out how to you know, build a successful, scaled up business on top of someone else's models and tech, technology. So I think mm -hmm. you're gonna have to look at things like, well, do we have like unique training data that we have a version that builds on top of the stuff and this data is proprietary and whatever. That's gonna be very rare, but I think there'll be those cases. I think there's yeah. gonna be, you know, people who monetize stuff in a very special way. There's gonna be people and companies who are able to bring things into real world applications that you know, require bits and atoms to work together. So I think there's going to be like mm -hmm. interesting stuff we can't even really conceive of yet. But I do think there is this question of, you know, are you just an API partner of one of these models and one of these companies? Yeah. Are you actually creating durable value yourself? And, you know, frankly, like this is diff this is difficult. Like a lot of companies in, in, in the space I was in, in the kind of ads API business, you know, mm -hmm. they tried and, and were not able to build their own, you know, long term sustainable business on top of someone else's stuff. Um, so I think it will be challenging. Perfect. So Rob, um, one of the most asked question today is that how can people become an AI product manager? So what's your advice to them? Because it's so hot right now. So what's your advice? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, you know, uh, teams I've worked on have done a lot of AI stuff, you know, kind of uh, machine learning, computer vision related stuff, image recognition, so on. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, working on some of those kinds of basics and things that are like you know i like in general i like the i guess i would say i like the unsexy side of sexy technology so specific example you know we were competing for you know phds in ml and, and ai related disciplines mm -hmm. um when we were doing kind of image recognition for figuring out if yeah. you know people are trying to put porn in ads we were competing with people trying to, who wanted to build filters for Snapchat or Facebook or whatever, you know, com you know, real time exactly. computer vision applications. And so I think, again, like if you're, you know, if you're thinking about some of that stuff, I'd say look at some of the things, maybe the unsexy side or the fundamentals or the baseline, the basics and learn those. That's always a good thing to, uh, you know, to, you know, that's one way to kind of get up to speed on something in a way that maybe isn't as might be harder, less hard to get into than if you're trying to go work at the hottest new startup that's doing some of this stuff. Again, you should try that too, but mm -hmm. um, the reality is a lot of these fundamentals, I think will stand people in good stead if they learn them and they understand them uh, deeply. Exactly, all come from the foundations and fundamentals, and then you can move on to be the larger tech, smaller tech, and totally up to your, your career choice. Uh, so one yeah. last question to you, Rob, is that 
What's your opinion regarding investing? Like growth mindset, investing in themselves, and I think it's、mm-hmm. kind of new concept. Lots of people think about investing in stock market or buying some Bitcoin, different things. What's your opinion regarding investing in themselves and having a growth mindset? Do you think it's a foundation, most important thing compared with investing in stock market and real estate? So, what, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, I think.、Um You know, someone said to me recently that they don't have time for like networking and meeting other people outside of their core role. I'm like, you know, you kind of need to to do that. Like, you need to find、um, you know mentors outside of your 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 work or people that you trust that you can bounce things off of.、Um, I think you need to be taking courses. You need to be up 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 leveling your skills. I think if we take going back to your AI questions, like if you're really great at writing emails and that's like your core superpower, I'm like, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to develop some other skills. <laughs> Um, and again, I've worked with some of the best email writers I think on the planet. Like some PMs are really great at communicating. I think that'll still be a valuable skill. However, like it can't be the only thing. I think there's like definitely this. You know, po- folks get comfortable with the things that they're good at. I think you need to get out of your comfort zone and learn new skills, and you need to talk to get out of your comfort zone. Also, we're talking to people that maybe you know you wouldn't talk to otherwise, and learn things from them as well. So I think it's really going to be key to have a growth mindset. This is amazing, Rob. Thank you so much for sharing with us all, like golden nugget and everything you just shared with us.、Um, so, if the audience have follow up questions, where would they find you? My DMs are open on on LinkedIn and on Twitter, so people can can hit me up on either of those spots. And always happy to help make connections、uh, to other folks as well who can maybe be helpful. So yeah, feel free to hit me up on either of those platforms. This is awesome. So we're going to link Rob's Twitter、uh, in the description of the show note. It's very popular. He's like posting amazing stuff on Twitter. So, and like, subscribe, and comment on our show so that I can bring more amazing speakers on our Product Insider podcast. Awesome! Thank you for joining us, Rob, and thank you for everyone who joined us and submitting all your questions through the back end. That's amazing. Awesome! Thank you, guys. See you, Rob. And thanks. Thank you for joining us.